Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 15 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by actual FBI cases. In this episode, I interview retired supervisory special agent Mike Carbonell. Now, Mike spent most of his 28 years with the FBI working bank robberies, violent crime, and fugitives. And before he retired, he was the supervisor of the Philadelphia Violent Crime and Fugitive Task Force. Now, he tells us all about a kidnapping for ransom case in which a toddler was snatched from his family's business in Philadelphia's Chinatown with the threat that if the family didn't turn over $250,000, the toddler would be killed. Mike takes us through all the twists and turns of the case. It's pretty fascinating. Mike also talks to us about a long-term fugitive case he worked with an investigator from the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. This fugitive investigation involved Ira Einhorn, who killed his ex-girlfriend and then fled to Europe. It took many years, I think Mike said 20 years, before they were able to locate him, capture him, and return Einhorn to the United States, where he was prosecuted and convicted. What I really loved about the interview is what a good time we had. Mike is truly a character. And the great thing is that everybody listening will get an opportunity to see that FBI agents aren't dry and stiff with no personalities the way that we're portrayed on TV. I had to do a lot of editing to make sure that the episode stayed clean and politically correct. Mike takes his job seriously, but he loves to have a good time. And so do I. Before we get to that interview, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate the continued support of FBI Retired Case File Review. You are supporting the show by sharing it uh, with your friends and families on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and all the other social media platforms. You are supporting the show by subscribing to it on iTunes and on my website. And of course, by writing all those great ratings and reviews. I forgot to thank you and mention last week that the episodes have now been downloaded more than 100,000 times. One last thing before we get to the interview. I attended the Mystery Writers of America's Symposium earlier this week in New York. And I want to tell you all about it. It was an opportunity for me to meet fellow mystery, crime, and thriller writers, and a great opportunity to hear and learn from Grand Master Crime Fiction Writer Walter Mosley. I'll tell you more after the interview. Now, here's the show. Hi, everyone. I am excited to introduce my guest for today, Michael Carbonell. Hey, Mike. Hi, Jerry. I'm very happy to speak with you today because I know that you have had a fascinating career, most of it involving violent crime cases, bank robbery cases, things like that. And so I know you must have a great case for us to talk about today. I think I got a pretty good one, yeah. Okay, so tell us just a little bit about it first, and then we'll get into it in depth in just a little uh, bit. Yeah, in the 90s, uh, there was a two-year-old child that was kidnapped from his father's restaurant supply business in Center City for ransom, which is unusual. Oh, okay. That's going to be good. But before we start talking uh, in detail about that case, can we run down just real quickly your career? Now, I know... And this is going to be a surprise that, uh, for you that I know this, but I know that you were in the Marines first. Yes, yes, Jerry, you know that? Oh, not, yeah, not, how, how did I know not that? People do, since I wear it on my sleeve. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I think you talk about that uh, quite often. <laughs> uh, yeah, I spent four years in the Marine Corps as an officer, and I, I got out of the Marine Corps in 1979 and came in the FBI. 
and I was assigned to the Philadelphia division right after training school. And my first assignment was on the bank robbery squad. And I liked it so much. I pretty much stayed there for the rest of my career with, with some uh, detours into the uh, world of organized crime and the world of terrorism. Yeah. When you say you stayed on there, stayed on the bank robbery squad for most of your career, you even ended up being the supervisor of that squad. Well, yeah, it, it ended up morphing, and I ended up being the supervisor of, of the Violent Crimes Task Force, and I held that position for 11 years, and then retired from there. Okay. All right, so how many years altogether were you in the FBI? 28. 28 years. 28 that's and a, a half. That's a full career. So I'm very curious about this kidnapping case, especially one that involves ransom. Yes, Because usually, unfortunately for us, when there's a kidnapping case, um, it really ends up being, you know, a murder type. uh, Stranger. uh, The ones that I was involved in mainly were stranger abductions of children, which uh, always ended up poorly. Yes. Well, does this one have a happy ending? Yeah, it's very happy. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 All right. um, Why don't you start? When did you first learn that? This child had been kidnapped. Uh, well, actually, we had a call from the Philadelphia Police Department. What happened was the uh, the father, Andy Sue's father, had a restaurant supply business on, I believe it was 6th Street or 7th Street in Chinatown, or maybe 10th. And um, Andy Sue's father and his mother were in back of the business, and he was in the front playing with his brother and sister. And a man came in and opened the front door and snatched him. So the mother thought it was a stranger abduction, and that's normally for terrible purposes. So she ran to the police district, which was really right next door, and reported it. And then the police called us. Okay. Now, did the brother and sister, how, how old were they? Were They, they were old. To- Andy was the youngest. Yeah, they made it, might have been old enough to know something untoward had happened. So they ran back and told their parents. So you get this information from the Philadelphia police, correct? And then what happens? Well, then, then you really don't know. You really don't know what you have. If if it's a stranger abduction, uh, it's a whole different uh, uh, set of strategy, strategies. You you want publicity as much as you can get. Hopefully, hoping somebody will notice the child in 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 the company of somebody not their parents. But in this case, not long after Andy was taken, the parents were called by the kidnappers who said that they had him and it was and they wanted money. Did they have any idea, um, you know, who these people no, were? They had no idea. No, neither, and what, neither did we. And what type of money and what were they asking uh, for? I think they started out, if I recall, asking for two hundred fifty thousand, I believe. The problem was that. They spoke Chinese, and, they, and their English was not that good, and my Chinese is non-existent. So, okay. So um, we had to bring agents from New York City, from our New York City office down, that spoke that what? particular dialect, which I think was Mandarin. And we worked. All right, and how long did that take before they uh, were able to arrive? Well, as you well know, Jerry, when you have a two-year-old kidnapped, things move quick in the FBI. We don't mess around with that. So okay. as, as soon as... Um, Myself and another agent, Bob Jones, went over, who's a fine guy. We went over to the father's uh, business when we discovered it it was a kidnapping for ransom and listened to him on the phone trying to negotiate with the kidnappers. But, uh, you know, obviously we didn't understand what they were saying. But then they put the little boy on the phone with his mother. And even though Bob and I didn't speak Mandarin, we understood what was going on there. It It was a terrible scene. Wow. Now, this the, the business, what type of business was this? Restaurant supply. Okay. And did they have that type of money, 250000 Uh, No, but that's not what they ended up paying. But they had enough. But obviously the kidnappers thought that they could uh, handle that. Yes. So once you had uh, somebody there who could interpret the phone calls, what were you learning about the kidnappers? Not, not much, actually. Uh, we... Uh, I was there again when the, the guys came down from New York and uh, we uh, we accompanied them over to the business. And and at this at this particular point in time, because this is a ransom, a uh, kidnapping ransom, you don't want anybody to know about it. So you do not publicize it. It's 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 the, the opposite of what you do on a uh, stranger abduction case. But okay. fortunately for us, the press had gotten wind of this early on. 
So I was sitting in the back of the of the business with two uh, agents from New York that spoke Mandarin, and the pre- I'm not going to mention the, the, the station, but they're knocking on the front door looking for an interview. I called our press person and I said, "Get these people out of here. This is not good." And so they they left because I told the mother, "Don't answer the door." And then we had to negotiate with several of the media outlets in the city because they wanted to run the story. And we had to convince them by running the story, they were going to have a dead child on their hands and it was going to be their fault. So after some negotiation, the special agent in charge had to actually go over and talk to a couple of the heads of these news agencies to convince them that this was not the thing we needed for them to do. Do you have any idea how the media found out about it? Well, what what happens is it's not the full of Philadelphia police, but when, when they put something over the radio, it's not coded. So they put out that they had a kidnapping okay. early on, and then the media jumped all over that. And we 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 tried to back them off because they were calling incessantly. We tried to back them off, but initially they wouldn't hear it. So they sent a crew out to, as I mentioned when I was there, they sent a crew out to the to the restaurant supply business, which is what we didn't need. Eventually, they decided to back off. Yeah, and and I guess, you know, your biggest concern is, you know, you don't know where these kidnappers are. I mean, they could be across the street watching all of this. They could have been across the street watching all of this. Yes, absolutely. All right. So from their phone conversations, I take it, it appears uh, that they did not know that the media had uh, come out. They did not know that we were involved. No. Now, you know, as far as you going to the restaurant and talking with the parents, I mean, were you slipping through the back yeah. door? How were you doing that? Yeah, we came in through a back alley. All right. So you were really um, concerned that the kidnappers would see that they were cooperating with law enforcement. Correct. And uh, now, were they threatening? What were they threatening to do they're, if they're, the money wasn't paid? They're going to kill a child. Wow. Yeah. And okay. so, you know, it, it had a lot of urgency. Now, this happened on a Monday, from what I recall. Yeah. Okay. It was a Monday late afternoon, early evening. So you have, um, you know, a child snatched, you know, from the parent's business. Mm -hmm. You have a phone call. When did that first phone call come in? Probably a couple hours after. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So for for the first couple of hours, then you did think it was some type of a stranger kidnapping. Because in my experience, I've been involved in, unfortunately, too many of them. That's what it normally is. Kidnappings for ransom are rare. I would think I was only involved in really a couple that were really legitimate. Okay, so now you've got the phone call. You've got agents from New York yep. that are helping you uh, translate the conversations between the kidnapper and the parents. Yes. And so what are the instructions? Well, it, it, you know, at first they're demanding this large sum of money. It might have been more than 250 It was a lot. They were demanding a lot of money. Of course, the father didn't have that, and, and the, the federal government never puts any money in. We're not, we're not in the business of paying off kidnappers. So it was basically a negotiation for a couple of days. Oh, days. Oh, it was days. Yeah, it was days. Oh, wow. Yeah, but we had we had agents, myself and my partner, who was actually it was his case, but he and I worked hand in hand together. We really didn't go home for a week. We uh, we'd go home, maybe get took two hours sleep throughout, then come back. You know, I mean, this is this is a righteous case, especially when I'm when I'm sitting in the, in the in their office and I'm listening to the mother sob and I'm listening to the little boy on the other end of the line sobbing, and these creeps have them. You know, I was we were rather motivated to bring this case to uh, justice. Right. I can imagine so. Yeah. All right. So I, you're saying that this happened over a couple of days or a few days. Yeah. At the end of the first day, what do you know? Uh, not much. We know that it's a kidnapping for ransom. We know that the people that have them, we believe, are Chinese because they speak Mandarin. Uh, they know a whole lot about the father. You know, you try to go back through his background and try to find out, does he have any enemies? Does he owe anybody money, uh, gambling debts, you know, blah, blah, blah. We try to you got to be cautious now because you don't want you don't want this to get out. So you got to be kind of careful. Maybe if we have any sources in the community. But then again, that that's a that's a that's a tricky thing, too, because you don't want this to leak out. And as you say, these guys could be. They could have been from the neighborhood. We had no idea where they were from. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine the, the predicament you're in. You want to learn more about the father. I mean, I take it in some of those, the, the few kidnapping for ransom 
cases that you have experience, a lot of times they involve, you know, drug cases. Yes. Yeah. A lot of them were that drugs. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, uh, and, and, you know, and in my experience, not saying it's about the father in this case, but a lot of times if it's a child of, of, of an adult that's been taken, which, which I was involved in several of them, the parents are less than forthright with you because they're involved in some criminality. Okay. That wasn't the case here, but um, he was just a legitimate businessman that these guys okay. targeted. So now you're saying that you you're you're staying there around the clock well, as you're trying to resolve this case. We didn't stay at his place around the clock because we didn't want to draw attention to ourselves. Okay. So we told him, although it was difficult, we said just act like you normally act. Right. We we didn't want him to kind of veer from his regular routine. Uh, because we didn't want to draw any attention to our involvement. Sometimes in some communities, they will not report this and they'll handle it on their own. The victims themselves don't don't want to get involved. They don't want law enforcement to be involved. And do you think that might have, that would have been the case in this situation if first the parents thought that the if they had any idea that it was a ransom, they might not have uh, reached out for law I enforcement? I have my suspicions if it was a ransom, they probably would not have reached out for us, yes. All right, but she thought it was a stranger kidnapping, yes. and with the being so close to the Philadelphia she, police... Yeah, they're literally half a block away. All right, so the first day, you're, you're not getting a lot of information. How many times have the kidnappers called and made a demand? That first day, they only called once. From what I, re what I remember, they only called once. Okay, and what's going on on the second day? Uh, the second day, you know, we do what we do with the phones, try to trace the call back. <laughs> Could you give us a little bit more detail? I mean, do you have to have a search warrant in order to contact the telephone company to do, to do that? No, no. Well, things have changed over the years, but back mm -hmm. then, no, we just need to have his, we just needed ha to have his permission. Okay, and so we we got that. And then we were just, you know, you're kind of you're kind of sitting on your hands at that point. It's very frustrating because you know, we have no idea who these guys are. We're, you know, we're trying to work our sources, our gang sources in the, in the Asian gang community. And we were getting all kinds of information. Most of it was wrong. So you don't want to run off like mad dogs on wrong information that will alert anybody. So it's kind of a balancing act. Uh, we had we had a command post up 24-7. You know, we had assets from New York. I mean, you know, you can really get anything you want when you have a two-year-old kidnapped. It's kind of, kind of impressive to see what the what weight is brought to bear. Um, All kinds of resources uh, and tools and manpower. Manpower, anything we wanted, yeah, yeah, we 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 had. But for the first couple of days, it didn't really matter. I mean, there wasn't really any. There was very little communication, and I think they called the second day. And still, you know, talk, asking the father if he got, if he's starting to get the money together. And then he started negotiating a little bit more about, you know, he couldn't afford to pay that much. And this is basically the tenure of it for the next couple of days. Now, is it a situation where you are able to uh, intercept the phone conversations at the FBI office? Uh, yeah. I mean, are you able to listen? You know, that's how they have it on TV. They've got people in a van, you know, on the street. You know, around the block, and they're listening to all the phone uh, conversations. Yeah, but the, but the machine is more sophisticated now. But back back then, yeah, we would have we would have the interpreter listen. The agents from New York they would listen while the father was talking. You could set that okay. up on his phone. But we didn't want him to come to our office because we, we we were afraid if somebody had a surveillance on his business and they were calling him on the phone and he wasn't there, they would think that that was I because they were calling him on a landline phone, not a cell phone. Okay. Cell phones weren't really that popular back then. So it was a landline phone that he was calling on. So he was kind of uh, stuck in his business waiting for them to call. Yeah, you can. And I did that on one kid that case we had. We did roll the phone up to our office, and we had the, the victim's uh, grandmother answering the phone up there. But uh, we didn't want to do that in this case because, like you said, we, did, we just didn't know. All right, so the second day... Again, you know, you're maybe a phone call between the father and the kidnapping, but still not enough no, no, information no, for not, you to take. Not, not enough other than stuff that was rolling in from sources that was all nonsense, frankly. Some of it was really wacky, too. Like what? <laughs> Some guy said that the, 
<laughs> that it was a platoon of North, former North Vietnamese soldiers. They had the kid held at a, in a pool hall in Kensington. Nonsense. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what we said. What? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Source. I got discounted. I, yeah, I, I hope I hope that informant didn't get paid for that information. <laughs> well, I think the informant was nuts, and I think the agent was nuts, actually. So it was a perfect okay. yeah. one. <laughs> hey, but that's okay, because he got a stat for having <laughs> a, for and an informant. Yeah. Yeah. Your informant doesn't have to be sane. No, no, just, you you just have to have I, one. I had lots of them that were not sane, yeah. All right, so now we're on the third day. Well, Are you gonna? I mean, it, it basically continued in this holding pattern until until finally the, the the amount of money was agreed upon, and the drop site was agreed upon, and then now now we could now we could definitely do something now now it's you know so it was working all those details out with the kidnappers at that particular point in time. So and it. And at this point in time, they're not suspicious at all no. that he is cooperating. No, they were actually pretty stupid, as most criminals are. No, because they, well, and, and part of it was Jerry's because they never thought that he would tell, call the police because that's not normally done in that culture, from my experience. Okay. So they were fat, dumb, and happy. So they thought. <laughs> Okay, so what did they negotiate? What was the so finally, bottom line? Finally, for the- <laughs> finally, they negotiated one hundred fifty thousand dollars cash. Okay, and so I remember he got the money somehow, and then we xeroxed it all. Obviously, to get to see, like you know, you see the movies how they say, "Oh, that's marked money." There's no such thing as marked money. That's nonsense. Um, but we wanted the serial numbers to use later. You know, if we caught these guys with that money, that's pretty damning evidence. All right. So each bill was uh, copied so that you would have the serial. Yeah, number. You had like 10 guys doing it. And actually, we had one brand new agent that, that leaned over to a senior agent and said, hey, you know, if those kidnappers look in that bag, they're going to realize that's not real money. He thought we were Xeroxing the money to put in the bag. <laughs> I'm not- I'm not going to ask for any names. <laughs> ask for any names. <laughs> he grew up in, on a farm. <laughs> All right. So now you have the quote unquote marked money. We have the, we have the money. Yep. Where's the drop off location? Well, this is how stupid they are. And this this was this was the part that, that required the most intricate planning, frankly, because we didn't have any idea where they were going to make the drop. And so, you know, how Chinatown is. It's pretty packed. It's pretty, pretty dense. So we had, we must have had 50 agents out there and we had them on every street corner and every overpass and every parking garage looking down every street in Chinatown. Cause we figured, well, that would be the most likely place where, where they would, where the drop would be made. And then the deal was they would, they would make the drop and then they would call the father and tell the father where the child was. Yeah, that would make sense on a busy street. Just do kind of like a handoff. Yeah, or or you know, put it in a in a in a uh, locker at a bus station or whatever. So what did they decide to do? Well, because they were so arrogant and stupid, they decided to meet him at the parking lot of the uh, uh, what's that restaurant on Delaware Avenue? Um, the Rusty Scupper is that the name of it? I forget the name of the restaurant, but it, it was in a parking lot on Delaware Avenue. Uh, at like 10 in the morning when there was nobody there. I mean, they were not very smart. And the father was going to pull up in a white van, which he had, which was his business van, and hand them the money, and they were going to take off, and then they were going to call him and tell him where the where Andy was. So does it go down that yeah, way? Yeah, just like that. And so we had all kinds of air assets. We had ground assets. Now, you remember, we couldn't hit him until we knew where Andy was. Right. So... We followed him all the way to Maryland, down 95, far, wow. far to Maryland, yeah. And they and we were monitoring our father's phone, and they stopped at a rest stop, and one of them got out and used a payphone and called the father and said Andy was in a hotel in Atlantic City. Are you serious? Yeah. That's, so that's at that it. point, so what happens at that point? I take it you continue to follow them. Oh, they were toast then. 
until you until we, actually until have hands on. And what had happened was they uh, they they left Andy in a hotel by himself, and 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 how old is he again? Two years old. Two. And they they had given him sleeping pills all week long. That he was basically asleep for a week. Oh my god. Yeah. So. Uh, Were they feeding him? Yeah, but you know they didn't they didn't care about it. As a matter of fact, here's an aside to this story. A local police officer down there had stopped these two guys with Andy in the car on a routine traffic stop. And he thought something was not right. But because there was obviously no no uh, publicity about this, there's really nothing he could do about it. But he but he made, he filled out a report. And he thought something was not right because, because of their behavior. Yeah, because these two young guys with this little boy and they try to explain who he was. He's my you know, sister's son or something. But the cop was a smart guy. And he thought, now nah, something's not right here. But, I mean, there's nothing he could do about it. There was no traffic. I mean, other than I forget what he pulled him over for, some some minor traffic thing. That's just an aside to the story. But he, he did um, write down their license plate. I take their license, all that stuff, uh, yes. driver's license, yeah, all that all identifying that, information. That so now oh. they pull over in Merrill and they call the father. He's at he's at a uh, ho- ho- at a hotel in Atlantic City, but in the meantime he'd been crying for a couple of hours. And uh, who Andy in the hotel? In the hotel by himself, yeah. Okay. And one of the staff had had heard him crying and finally said something's wrong and went in the room and got him. And he was a little boy in there by himself, you know, a baby. Really, he's two years old, and called the police. So the police came. And then by the time the police came, we called the police and said, go to this hotel right away. And they said, we're already here. Wow. Hold that. Hold him. He's a kidnapping victim. Wow. Mm-hmm. Now that's <laughs> that's kind of that's amazing how that worked out. It was. Well, that must have been a relief to you, because instead of having those still, you know, minutes before the police arrive at the hotel, you immediately, you know, Get to know that the, that Andy is safe. Yeah, and they took him to the hospital, and yeah, he, the agent took him to the hospital. He was fine, you know, other than trauma, you know. So, so tell me about what happens with this uh, well, this van going down to Maryland. It wasn't a van; it was a car. Okay. The van. Oh, that's right. The, van was the father car. had the van. So, 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 so yeah. Tell me what ha- what's going on with this car going down to Maryland. The kidnapper gets in a car, and they get back on ninety five, and now they're done. I mean, they're, now we're going to get them. So we did a rolling car stop. So we pull one guy in front of him, one guy behind him, and two cars on the side. And we ease him over. And we have a plane on him, too, so they weren't going anywhere. And we eased them over to the side. Onto, you know, we showed our badges and all, and eased them over and then arrested them. And found and they, had a, they had a loaded revolver in a the car. They had all the money, and they had the father's uh, phone number. So what we call that evidence. <laughs> Pretty evidence. good evidence. Yes. So, who were they? Did the father know them? No, he didn't know them. They were from Atlantic City, New Jersey. So, why him? Why did they choose you know, him? I don't think we ever found that out. But I do remember they got a. That, that's a that's a life sentence. Oh, really? So For both of them? Federal court. That's a life sentence. Kid, uh, kid uh, kidnapping a minor, possession of a weapon. Oh, yeah, that's a life sentence. Because I remember we went down and interviewed some of their friends that they shared a house with in Atlantic City, and they were rather cavalier about it. And then we had a, an interpreter with us, and he said to them, I don't know why you're being so cavalier, because if we find any of you are involved, you're, you're facing a life sentence also, because you're involved in the conspiracy. And then they, they look ghastly after that. Now, were there other people involved no, we, other than these no, two? Just these two. No. I, I'm, I, you know what, Jerry? I don't remember. I don't think so. I think these two, and I think they end up getting like forty-five years apiece. Wow! They got a, they got a, well, they deserved it. So did they plea or did they? Uh, yeah, was this they a trial? Pled guilty. They, they okay. threw themselves on the mercy of the court. We had them. We had them. We had their voices that we recorded when they were making the calls, and of course, you know the money, and we had the, the, the xeroxes which had the same serial numbers, and the father's uh, directions to his place they had drawn, and yeah, they weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer. Now, I remember this being a, a very big media yeah, it was. event. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, and you had to, because you had, uh, 
you know, gotten the cooperation of the media to back off. So, right. you know, when it finally was able to talk about you it, they wanted they hard to talk about they, it. They, they, they wanted their pound of flesh, yeah. So I know there's lots of uh, newspaper articles, and, uh, you know, I'll find those, and I'll put links uh, to those newspaper articles on my website, jerrywilliams.com, so anybody wants to, to take a look and get a little bit more detail. Yeah, it was really a – it was nerve-wracking. You know, normally – I mean, you know, I've worked violent crimes a long time, so you kind of get used to it. And most of the time, it's bad guy hurting bad guy. So, But uh, when you have a little boy like that kidnapped and sitting in there seeing his mother sobbing, boy, I wanted to, I wanted to bash these two guys. But you didn't. No, we didn't. You know, we don't do that. <laughs> One of them did get beat up in prison, though. Oh, really? What was that about? Uh, they were in the whole, they were in the holding cell in Maryland. And then before when we went down to get him and he was in one cell and his buddy was in another cell. And apparently his buddy picked an argument with two guys who were in a cell with the guy got beat up. And so they took it out on him. They beat him. I wasn't, I wasn't upset. Uh, I'm sure you weren't. I'm sure you weren't. That's called, that's called justice. That's yes, it is. They, they, yeah, they could have killed that little boy. They gave him, gave him sleeping pills all week long. They could have killed that little boy. All right, so, you know, in the movies and the books and everything, the best part of the kidnapping case is when the child is returned. Were you there? Uh, I was not. I was with the two kidnappers. I mean, I was at the press conference and all that stuff afterwards. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was, I, I would imagine it was pretty emotional. Any Anything else that uh, you want to tell me about the uh Kidnapping no, of Andy. It was a, it was a great, great. It was. I'll tell you, that's that was a case that gave you a lot of satisfaction. At that, when we got these guys, especially with all the evidence that was in the car, you know, I mean, I was involved in a lot of cases like that over the years, not kidnappings, but others. And that was that was a very satisfying case. To all of us, the whole squad, the whole squad worked it. We all worked it. You know. Now. You had a very famous case, and I want to talk about that maybe for about uh, just a few minutes, and that's the Ira Einhorn case. Can you tell us who Ira Einhorn is, or was that a was? Yeah, no, he's he's still in prison. Um, okay, can, yeah. So, can you tell us who Ira Einhorn is, and a little bit about the fugitive case that you were involved in? Yeah, Ira Einhorn was a um, political figure. He ran for the mayor of Philadelphia at one time in his 70s. He had attended the University of Pennsylvania. He lectured at Harvard. Uh, he was uh, one of the founders of Earth Day. He was friends with Jerry Rubin and the people from the anti-war movement in the 60s. He was involved in that. And he was dating a woman named Holly Maddox. They were actually living together. And she decided to leave him. And she left him and went up to New York and he called her and said, you know, I'm going to throw your stuff out. You better come back down and get it. And she did. And then she disappeared. And the family hired a guy named J.R. Pierce, who was a retired FBI agent from Philadelphia. And Pierce began to poke around. And he was convinced that Ira had murdered her and that her body was still in the apartment. So he went to the Philadelphia Police Department and laid out all his suspicions Based upon that, they got a search warrant and went into Iron's apartment and found her body in a steamer trunk. Wow. And how long had the body been in the steamer trunk? Uh, about 18 months. So she was com almost completely decomposed. In fact, she had decomposed and her uh, body juices had leaked down to the apartment below. They thought there were dead rats there. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so they arrested him. They put him out on bail, which is unheard of, and he took off. And then it was about 20 years till we got him. Well, so he was a fugitive for over 20 years. Just about, yeah, I think it was about 20 years. Yeah, it was a worldwide pursuit. He left, he got out of the U.S. almost immediately. A lot of twists and turns in the case, yeah. So when was the first time you became involved oh, in the case? Oh, I was a brand case? new agent when, when, when he jumped bail. And then I got the case probably years later. Uh, and then I worked on it, worked in. I mean, it was really stale for a while. You know, we would have some, well, then he ended up going to Ireland and, uh, we had no extradition treaty, so we couldn't get him back. So you knew definitely he was oh, there. Oh, he was absolutely there. Absolutely. 100% there. Then, it, you know, we finally got him in France and that's kind of an interesting story. How'd you get him? Well, 
we knew we knew that he was living with a woman named Annika Floden, who was a Swedish national, because it's kind of I don't want, I don't want to go into all that part of the because it'll take too long. But okay, but um, we uh, we uh, I didn't have the case at this time. Another agent did, but uh, he was being he was being bankrolled by a woman, a very wealthy woman in Canada, and we found out about it and kind of put pressure on her, and she told us where he was. But she she dimed us out. So before the Swedish police could get there, he took off. But we knew. All right. So so he was in Ireland and then he was in Sweden. He was in Ireland. He was in Wales. He was in England. We, I, I, we interviewed a guy who 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 uh, talked to him. And these were all like big time people, you know, rock stars, millionaires. This guy had a big line of BS and people believed it. Like he convinced everybody that the CIA and the FBI killed Holly Maddox and planted the body in his apartment to, to disgrace him. And, you know, some dopey people actually believe that, you know, you know, Jerry, you were in the FBI. We're not that slick, you know, so. no, we're not that slick <laughs> to do conspiracy. All the conspiracy theories no. uh, are worthless yeah, because it never happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't they know we're just about the facts. Yeah. We're, but we're all about the facts. Jerry. Anyway, we knew who, I, we knew who Anika Floden was and she was very uncooperative. So then now I have the case. So I decided, well, all right, let's go back to square one. Let, let me have uh, Anika Floden re-interviewed. Now, when you deal with legats, it's a pain, legal attaches, because what I would have to do is I'd have to send the lead to London, and then they'd have to get it, and then they'd go to the Swedish police and ask them to interview Anika Floden. So whenever you send a lead internationally, unless it's terrorism or something, it takes six months at least to get an answer back. So it's frustrating. It's slow. It's well, in the movies, don't you just hop on a plane and go over there and do the interview yourself? Yeah, yeah, you do. But that's the movies. So uh, the Swedish police get back to us. They say, "Well, she doesn't live in. She left. She left Sweden." And so, what's the next logical thing you would ask? Well, where did she, where go? she go? Denmark. So we followed her to Sweden to Denmark, and in Denmark, that was it. The trail grew, grew cold. So I felt very, very, very strongly that she was with him, but we had nothing. So then years later, there, there was a woman who called the DA's office because I worked this case very close with a guy named Richie De, De Benedetto, great guy from the DA's office. This woman called him and said, hey, she had a relative. She was mad. There was some show on about Einhorn. And uh, there's a funny you want to hear this funniest side of that? Yes. OK, we put him on America's Most Wanted. And so Richie and I went down there, but we knew he was in Europe, but he looks like a biker. So every biker and everybody that knew a biker in America called and said, I, Reinhardt's living in Arkansas or Southern California or whatever. When we knew we were hoping somebody from Europe would call us. But so at the end of the night, I have all these tip sheets that I'm going through and it says <laughs> the fugitive was sighted at this town in New Jersey, which is where I live. And I said, <laughs> Well, what the heck? And then it said, and he's living on this road in this town in New Jersey, which is where I live. Oh. It says, it's a little bald guy with bad breath. Gave my address. One of my squad mates called in America's Most Wanted and put my address. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> did you? Oh, I howled. I know who did it. I howled. Oh, my, I howled. Because I said, Richie, look at this. There's a tip in South Jersey, and I said, Oh, wait a minute. So, so you had a, you had a a sheet of tips, yes, that you were reviewing, and that's, that's how that's how I saw this tip, yes, on me, <laughs> on you. Boy, wouldn't that make a great podcast <laughs> if we talked about? <laughs> Some of the um, funny things that happen. In the funny things. Oh, I mean, you guys are all practical jokers. It was hilarious. And, oh. and, you know, there's a lot of hilarious stories, and I'm I'm very sorry <laughs> that I can't uh, I can't share them. Just take my word for no, it. No, I, I don't. All right. So, how do you find them? How, how do you get Ira Einhorn? So we uh, this woman had a, a relative who was a policeman in Sweden and, and she had seen a show and she was, a, she was in, re, in outrage that the Swedish police weren't a little more um, aggressive. So we got this guy's name and it, it always helps to have a personal contact. So we contacted him and uh, in Sweden, apparently everybody has a national ID number. 
and a, and a national ID. Right. And so we said, well, could you see if there's any recent activity? And, and the, he looked in there and he said, yeah, uh, we just got a letter from her. She's requesting a copy of her Swedish driver's license because she's now living in France. And her name. Now, who is this? Who is this you're talking to? Who is this guy? Policeman in in uh, in, St- in Sweden, Stockholm, Sweden. So this woman who watched the show right. contacted this police and asked him to no, help. Con- you. No, contacted us and put us directly in contact with him. Okay. And uh, so he said, "Yeah, we just there's a letter in here in her file from France requesting a copy of her driver's license." So right away, I knew. Okay, that's him. And she was using the name um, Anika Flood Mallon, and Eugene Mallon was a guy that we were aware of in Dublin, Ireland, who was friends with Einhorn. So I was convinced that Einhorn was using that as an alias. So we sent okay. a lead to Lee at Paris to say, hey, go to this place. It was in champagne Montan, France. And actually, the French police were very good. They went right out there, put a surveillance on them, and caught them. Bang. That was it. Now, I do know the story because they had him. He was under arrest. But before they would send him back to the U.S., let him go. We had to agree on something. What was that? Well, he had been tried in absentia because he jumped bail. So in the U.S., if you jump bail and you're fully aware of your charges, they can try you in absentia because you've already been charged. Well, the French, you know, in my opinion, being the French, they uh, they said, no, no, uh, no. We're not going to give him to you unless you retry him and you can't and he can't be uh, face a death penalty, which he never faced anyway. He never faced a death penalty because the death penalty had not been enacted when he was charged with this crime. Okay. so it was all a political nonsense, frankly. So they agreed to retry him. And And so he was returned to the United States. Was there a trial or did he end up fleeing? I testified at it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was tried. And was he bringing up all of these conspiracy theories I, again I, about I mean, his, his his defense witnesses were so weak. It was it was laughable. It was it was insane. No, he, yeah, he tried to. But, you know, he did, none of it held water. I mean, Jerry, is there's a dead body in your steamer trunk in your apartment. Explain that away. Right. And it's been there for 18 months. Well, not only that, not only that, but the steamer, the, the steamer trunk had a, a, a padlock on it. It was in a closet with a padlock on it, and the keys were in his kitchen. So it's not like, well, okay, so the CIA and the FBI killed her, padlocked it, padlocked the the, the closet door, and then left the keys hanging in your kitchen. And the smell of the dead body. I guess he didn't. I guess he didn't care. He was an arrogant guy, but now he's in prison for the rest of his life. And how many years did he get? Life. Life in Pennsylvania is life. Good. That's where he needs to oh, be. Oh, that's where he needs to be, absolutely. Yep. So for most of your career, then, you were working violent crime uh, on, and on the uh, Violent Crime Fugitive Task Force. Well, I was on a Fugitive Task Force. I was on the what they call the reactive squad. Then I was on a Fugitive Squad for five years. That was eight agents and eight Philadelphia police detectives. And then I got promoted, and then I took over the Violent Crimes Task Force, and I did that for 11 years. So you retired in 2008. Yes, and uh, what have you been doing since then? Well, actually, I got hired by the FBI, and I'm working for them training agents in um, streetcraft. Streetcraft. Tell us a little uh, bit more to, about that. How to be safe, how to how to uh, handle your sources safely, things like that. I started doing that when I retired for the CIA. Okay, and now you're doing uh, it for the yeah, FBI. Well, I enjoy it. The agents are good. They're smart. They're dedicated. They're yeah. I teach a two week course and a four week course. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, all right. Is there anything else that you want to say about your career, about the FBI? No, I enjoyed it. It was a great, great job. The guys and guys and gals that worked for me were top notch. And that's the end of the interview. And as always, back at JerryWilliams.com. You'll find photos of Mike Carbonell and links to newspaper articles about the Andy Sue kidnapping and the prosecution of fugitive Ira Einhorn. Now, as you know, this is a true crime and crime fiction podcast where I give information to crime fiction writers and crime fiction readers about the FBI. Earlier this week, I went up to New York to attend a one-day Mystery Writers of America 
Edgar Symposium. And that is Edgar, as in Edgar Allan Poe. The seminar or symposium was absolutely brilliant. What they did is bring in all of the nominees for the Edgar Awards, which is like the Oscars for Mystery Writers of America, and have them talk about different aspects of writing crime fiction. And one of the things I talked about constantly was research, you know, getting a full understanding and making sure information was accurate and that readers, you know, were getting all of the in depth and description and colors and uh, smells and feelings of whatever time and subject they were talking about. What was interesting is that at the very end of the symposium, best-selling author Walter Mosley of Devil in a Blue Dress was interviewed. And he said something that I thought was pretty amazing. They asked him the same question about research, and he said he did some research, but he was told by his writing teacher, and I quote, it doesn't matter if it's real. It only matters if the reader believes it. Cool. That's good to know. I know in pay to play, there's a trial that takes place, and I have my main character authenticating evidence after it's been introduced in court. Now, I know that that's not the way it really works, but in order to have this scene flow correctly, I needed to write the chapter that way. And I've always felt kind of guilty not getting it accurate, not getting it right. But Walter Mosley just told me that that's okay. So I'm glad I left that in the book. So my crime fiction recommendations this week are that you read anything written by best-selling author Walter Mosley. I've been contacted by a few people, uh, including Mike, that for some reason they're not receiving my crime fiction newsletters. If that's the case, as long as you are on my email subscription list, you can just email me at jerrywilliamsauthor at gmail.com and I'll send it to you directly, including the list of current TV shows featuring the FBI. That seems to be very popular. As a matter of fact, I have several requests that I actually review some of the shows and let you know what they get right and what they get wrong. And because I want to give you what you ask for, I will be reviewing Quantico. I actually watched the first two episodes of the series, but I kept getting distracted by the main character's hair. I mean, she's got a lot of hair, but I will jump back in there, take a look at the show, and let you know what they get right and what they get wrong. All right, this episode was sponsored by FBIRetire.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I hope you come back next week to listen to yet another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.